On January 31st this year, City Club kicked off a four program series entitled Made in the USA Jobs in Oregon. This series has been developed by the club's Business and Labor Standing Committee. Our first speaker was Wim Belzink, Executive Vice President and Manager of Group Operations at Tectronics. Today we are pleased to present Tom Bruguer, who will speak on the leadership and sense of vision needed to start and run a successful company. In the book, Leaders, The Strategies for Taking Charge, Warren Bennis and Burton Anna State, I quote, a creative mental process occurs when neither the problem nor the method, let alone the solution, exist as a known entity. The highest form of discovery always requires problem finding. This is very like the identification of a new direction or vision for an organization. In 1981, Tom Bruguer, who was then software engineering manager at Tektronics, decided, along with three other employees, to leave to start their own company. They had a compelling desire to have their own company, yet they did not have a product. They wanted to let the marketplace define the product. Accordingly, they spent four months finding a product. Their search succeeded, and Tom Bruguer is president, chief executive officer, and chairman of the board of Mentor Graphics Corporation. Their revenues have gone from the first year when it was dipped or maybe even drenched in red in 1982 to 137 million in 1985. They now employ over 700 people in 36 offices worldwide. And what is the product that brought this success? Mentor Graphics is a leader in computer-aided engineering. They build computer-aided engineering workstations, which, as you all know, aid in designing integrated circuits and printed circuit boards. Mentor is working on automating more things, such as doing more electronic testing and circuit layout. Tom Bruguer holds a bachelor's degree in mathematics from the University of Santa Clara, in Santa Barbara, rather, a master's in computer science from the University of Wisconsin, and a master's in business from Pepperdine University. He managed computer architectural design and new products planning activities at Burroughs Corporation before he came to Tektronics. In 1984, he was named Small Business Person of the Year. In 85, he was named Oregon Executive of the Year. He serves as Vice Chairman of the Oregon Center for Advanced Technology Education and as a Director at Reed College. Please welcome entrepreneur Tom Bruguer. Thanks, Cecilia. That was uh, perhaps the clearest explanation of computer-aided engineering that I've heard in a long time. <laughs> for those of you out there who are in the market for equipment, I'm sure you won't need to do evaluations any further after uh, having heard that. Um, the title of my talk, I noticed from the uh, City Club Bulletin that was sent out, is uh, The Age of the Entrepreneur. Um, I would like to put that to rest very quickly. For those of you who are interested, uh, as of last month, the age of the entrepreneur is 40. <laughs> <laughs> Or as a friend of mine said, I feel more like I do now than I ever have before. <laughs> uh, in, in these situations, um, Abraham Lincoln once said that, uh, and I would tend to agree with him, that I am not yet so old as to not be embarrassed to get up and talk about things about which I know little of. Um, entrepreneurship um, is, uh, is an interesting uh, activity and certainly an interesting uh, thing to be talking about. What I'd like to do today is uh, talk about three different kinds of things, really. I'd like to talk a little bit about what an entrepreneur is, because I find in these kinds of gatherings often um, there will be some of you who are sitting back there asking the same questions that I was asking a number of years ago. That is, am I an entrepreneur? Can I go off and start a company? How do I know if I am one? Um, how would I know if I stumbled into one on the street? and maybe give you a little sense of some of the things that we did in order to uh, get a company started. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what it takes to have uh, an environment for entrepreneurism, both uh, on a national policy level as well as on a state policy level, and relate that a little bit finally to Oregon and some of the things that we have going for us here, and perhaps some of the things that we can improve uh, along the way in Oregon. To get started on what an entrepreneur is, if you go to Webster's, they will define an entrepreneur basically as someone who goes off and creates a new business, a business where there was not one before. 
um, often makes money, sometimes does not make money um, out there, but does create a, a new business. Um, from our standpoint, uh, when we got started uh, at Mentor Graphics, we really got started, uh, as was mentioned, without any idea of what product it was that we were going to build. We, um, we had our friends off telling us that we were foolish, that we were maximizing the risk out there, how could we do such a crazy thing. We told them that what we were doing was taking a market-driven approach. It really all depends upon your perspective uh, in these things. So we left and uh, we went off really um, out of no dissatisfaction for the companies that we were working for, which were very fine companies, but more because of a sense that we wanted to get on a faster learning curve. We had the feeling that what we were doing is we were sitting up in the stands watching the game down on the field, and now what we wanted to do is we wanted to get down there on the field and bash heads a little bit. I can tell you now after five years of bashing heads down there that you cannot do that without a few injuries along the way. Um, so we actually left and, um, and left the company. I left the company that I was working for um, on Friday the 13th, trying to put every good omen that we could think of uh, together there. Um, and went out with no idea what we were going to do, but we picked up the phone and we started calling a number of people on the phone, asking customers, so what kind of problems do you have? What kind of trends do you see? What kind of products do you need to solve these problems and, and meet these trends? Um, and then we, uh, we conceptualized a product uh, based on that. We found that in the entrepreneurial stage, we needed to do a lot of things that one doesn't normally think of doing. Um, for example, we were living off something that uh, we called the Memorial Fund back then, which was an um, investment of all of our savings. It uh, amounted to a few thousand dollars. Uh, we called that the Memorial Fund because it, when it ran out, it was going to be a memorial to us all at the time. What I would do is I would uh, get up in the morning, uh, very leisurely, I have to tell you, and uh, along about 9 o'clock, I would start calling the East Coast to uh, ask customers questions. Now, I did that because 9 o'clock, our time on the East Coast, of course, is noon back there, and everybody was out to lunch. <laughs> and so they would have to call me back on their own nickel. <laughs> we would do the same thing to the West Coast around noontime. We learned learn very quickly how, how to save money. Um, we would go out to lunch with people and sit down and talk about various business discussions, and we learned very quickly uh, the art of uh, when the check was about to come, getting up to make a phone call or go to the restroom. <clears throat> uh, those are the kinds of things that one needs to do in an entrepreneurial environment in order to, uh, <laughs> well, to survive. Um, we finally hit the big time and we moved out into a small office uh, facility that was about 300 square feet. We had um, each, there were three of us at the time, we each donated a card table to the organiza organization and we had our marketing head at the time donate three folding chairs. It was part of our great marketing giveaway program that has carried through ever since then. <laughs> We had uh, two telephones that sat on the floor and uh, we went out to one of the local high schools and we uh, begged uh, an uh, obsolete blackboard that they had, which we leaned against the wall. We had numbers written all over this blackboard because we were trying to raise money at the time and we had all of our scenarios uh, up there. Um, and people used to come by and they'd look in here and they'd see these three card tables and these folding chairs and the telephones on the floor and the blackboard leaning against the wall and the paper on the floor. They thought it was a bookie joint out there. <laughs> and that we were running numbers. And I have to tell you, our landlords out there, they had no idea whether we were going to be paying the rent the next month or we were going to be gone during the middle of the night, uh, all, of, all of which at the time might have been possible. Um, but we went off and uh, conceptualized a product and um, uh, wrote a business plan. At the time, uh, we had three people, all um, MBAs, two of them with Harvard MBAs. Um, and believe me, with a couple of Harvard MBAs, we could generate paperwork like you would not believe <laughs> out there. The only thing we couldn't do is get the same kind of consulting fees that they would have normally gotten uh, to that. So we wrote a grand and glorious business plan that showed um, a number of things. Um, first of all, it showed um, in excruciating detail that was proved in many, many pages of numbers that would drive one blind that we could grow a profitable company with sales per employee of $50,000 and expenses per employee of $60,000. So we were spending more on our employees than we were taking in in revenue, but we proved beyond the shadow of a doubt mathematically that we were going to make money. <coughs> we now call that the Moth and Buyer Theorem for Entrepreneurial Activities. Um, we then went off and uh, were fortunate enough to be able to um, raise a little bit of money uh, to get started. Our business plan had showed that um, we would be able to start and grow this company to about a $50 million a year company over about an eight-year period of time uh, with a $600,000 investment, and that all we would ever need would be $600,000. So we let ourselves be talked into taking $900,000 in a first round of financing, thinking that, well, not only do we have enough money to grow the company, but we can probably buy a few companies along the way and, and draw a little interest on an annuity. Um, well, to date, Mentor Graphics now has grown from, um, from zero back then in 1981 to about $137 million in sales. 
And in order to do that, we have had to raise $120 million in cash in order to do that. Now, we determined that uh, at one point that perhaps what we should do is go into the business of professionally raising money, because if nothing else, we were very good at going off and, uh, and raising money. Um, we have grown now to uh, where we do have offices worldwide, um, uh, subsidiaries uh, throughout Europe and throughout Asia, and do have the leading market share in the business that we're in. Um, looking at uh, what characteristics we brought to the party or brought to the game out there, um, uh, there were a couple, um, but perhaps the most important, I would say, were, um, were two, those of uh, vision and those of being able to attract the right kind of people to the company. If you go off and you do, as I did, and you read some articles about entrepreneurship to try to find out, uh, do I fall into any of these categories? Can I do any of those things? Am I one of those? You find things like, um, um, first of all, most entrepreneurs are the first children of a self-employed father. Well, I have an older brother and a sister. Uh, my father worked for years as a salesman for a candy company, and so he certainly was not self-employed. Uh, the other two founders, one of them had five sisters, and the other was the youngest of uh, three children. Well, we didn't quite fit into there, so we were worried, so just to start right off. <clears throat> um, secondly, they'll tell you that entrepreneurs tend to have entrepreneurial tendencies very early in life, early in, the, in their childhood. So we thought back and we thought back, and uh, the closest I could come to a strong entrepreneurial tendency back when I was a child is uh, back in the 50s when um, the Hungarian Revolution was going on. Uh, we brought a bunch of people in the neighborhood together, uh, showed a few movies and sold popcorn for five cents in order to raise a little money for the Relief Society. We raised $1.50. <laughs> we lost about $25 <clears throat> because we were giving away the candy that my father was selling at the same time. <laughs> no one else could do much better in their early childhood, so we put that aside very quickly. Um, we went back and found out that most entrepreneurs don't do well in school. Well, quickly we could relate to this. <laughs> We had, we had no problems at all relating to this. Um, when I was an undergraduate in college, uh, there was a clear race to see whether the dipping grade point average curve was going to cross the line before the rising cr uh, credit unit grade uh, curve would, to see whether or not I would actually get out of the place. And um, we, our other two founders, uh, one of them was a um, chemistry major who was going to go to um, medical school, except that he flunked organic chemistry. <coughs> And for some reason, they thought that was going to be a problem for him. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, the other was a chemistry major who was going to also go on to a medical school. But he found out very early that he fainted at the sight of blood. And this is an individual who was an all-American football player. So he decided that school was not really the best thing for him. So we related very strongly to the educational um, side of things. Um, we also read that um, entrepreneurs tend to uh, be higher than average in aesthetic and theoretical leader leadership and lower in practical mindedness, conformity, and need for support. Well, we didn't have the slightest idea what that meant. <laughs> so we figured out we would evaluate that after the fact. <clears throat> um, we did read, however, that most entrepreneurs have a high need for achievement, and I think I would have put us all into that category. We, we all felt fairly confident about our own abilities and our um, ability to go off and do something, and uh, we certainly were very optimistic about things. Um, back in the early days, we used to hope and hope and hope that if we were going to have a crisis, it would occur on a Monday or a Tuesday so we could do something about it on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, rather than have it happen on a Friday and have to have the weekend when we couldn't do anything about it. And that was the biggest thing that we would worry about back in the, those days. And the last thing that, um, that we read and that we found, and that I guess I would uh, still tend very much to agree with in the, in the people that I've met since uh, having gotten Mentographic started, um, is that most entrepreneurs are really not motivated by money. And I would say it was definitely the case uh, for those of us who were going off to start Mentographics, uh, that we were really not motivated by the financial side of things. It was probably 30% in the equation. When Mentor Graphics went public, there were over 20 people in the company that were worth over a million dollars on paper. Nevertheless, of all the people that got the company started, the financial aspect of getting things going was really very, very low. We really wanted to get out there and get on a faster learning curve. We wanted to have the opportunity to learn a little bit about uh, what the world was like to, to play in the, uh, on the field rather than uh, to be up there in the stands. Um, in fact, um, uh, Sherman Fairchild, who uh, of course was the founder of Fairchild Industries and the son of the, one of the founders of IBM, uh, once made the observation that uh, the man who thinks just of making money usually doesn't make much money after all. 
Uh, and we have found uh, very much that to be true in an entrepreneurial situation, that the focus on money is really very minor. It's the focus on um, building something, on learning, and on getting out there and uh, participating rather than uh, spectating that tends to be more important. Of the things uh, that I mentioned that we did well, um, visionary-wise, uh, we tended to run the company, and still do in some uh, respects, in a very intuitive sense, uh, in a way. Um, we make most of our best decisions in 15 minutes, most of our major decisions in 15 minutes. When we overanalyze things, we find out that that's when we make mistakes. Um, and so we tend to have a strong intuitive sense of what we're doing. We have a, have always had a vision that what we wanted to do was to go off and build a company that was going to be um, a world leader, was going to be a profitable company, was going to be a respected company by its customers and by its employees and by the community, and was going to be a major public company, uh, perhaps even someday a Fortune 500 company. And that was, a, was and is and always has been the vision that we've had of it. The products tend to be secondary. Uh, we, we produce computer-aided engineering products, which I, you now all understand. Um, it could have been almost anything else as far as we're concerned. The product was not that important. Uh, it's the process and the activity and the learning curve that was more important to us. The second thing that we did very well uh, is hire good people. We surrounded ourselves with the best people that we could find in all the areas that we went out to, uh, um, to hire people in. And that was perhaps the best thing that Mentor Graphics has going for it, is the quality of the people that work for it. And in fact, if you go out and you talk to most entrepreneurs and ask them what it is is their unfair advantage, um, most of the, of the successful ones will tell you that their unfair advantage is the fact that they have high quality people associated with them. Uh, and that perhaps, if, for those of you who are thinking about starting companies, I think that is perhaps the best advice uh, uh, that I would give you. Um, in terms of um, what it takes to have an entrepreneurial environment, um, my conclusion now is that entrepreneurism uh, may be on the way out since it has suddenly become faddish. Um, and as an old uh, professor of mine once said, um, <clears throat> as soon as something becomes in, you can expect it to be on the way out. Um, now while that's not likely to happen, um, I, it, it seems to be a very heavy focus on entrepreneurism today, although entrepreneurs have been around for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, it, in Portland, back um, 60, 70, 80 years ago, of course, we had many fine entrepreneurs that were getting timber companies and paper companies going. A little bit later on in the shipping business doing, uh, doing quite well. Um, later on, as we began to move into, um, in this country, as we began to move into different uh, technologies, um, some of you may recall when the steam locomotive industry was the largest industry in this country. And, the, and there were entrepreneurs off getting steam locomotive companies going. Back in the 40s, when the concept of venture capital uh, was really invented by the Rockefellers and the Whitneys back on the East Coast, the high technology industry of the day was the aircraft industry. And in the post-World War II days, um, they found themselves making investments in companies like Eastern Airlines and uh, Douglas Aircraft and uh, the predecessors to Boeing, et cetera. Um, now, um, of course, in the 50s, we saw companies in the plastics area getting going. Now the focus is very much on the electronics area and a lot of concern and interest in getting companies in the electronics area going and started and, uh, and everyone bringing electronics companies into, um, into their cities. The reason for that is that the electronics industry today is the leading manufacturing sector employee, now larger than the automotive industry. The electronics industry today employs about two and a half million people and over the last about seven years, the electronics industry in new jobs had, has added the equivalent of five steel industries just in new jobs over the last five to seven years. Now, why is that? The reason is that we're beginning to see technology um, come so pervasively into everything that we do. It's not just electronics companies that use technology. Now the new steel companies are using new technology in order to run their plants. The um, profitable and many of the successful timber companies are beginning to use technology in their plants to get more out of the logs that they're cutting. The largest single user of semiconductor parts in the world today is General Motors. And in fact, today the average car has 100 integrated circuits in it. That number is expected to grow in the next uh, five years to about 500 integrated circuits. So you can see we are all going to be driving computers over the next five years. And that's why we want you all to begin to get familiar with computer-aided engineering systems um, over time. <laughs> now, that kind of growth in technology, we believe, is going to continue because um, Moore's law from Gordon Moore at Intel uh, essentially says that the, uh, 
um, the amount of technology you can get on a single in integrated circuit will double about every two years, and it, it is continuing to do that. Uh, computer technology is such, of course, that, uh, that systems that would have filled maybe a quarter of this room uh, 20, 30 years ago now can be found on a chip that you can barely see on the tip of your finger. Um, what we see, in addition, is um, new types of technology applications, uh, applications of technology now in everything from um, uh, washing machines to refrigerators to cellular telephones. Uh, one of our customers tells us that in the next few years, uh, you'll have a cellular telephone for your car that's the size of a credit card that you'll be able to carry around with you everywhere. I don't know about you, but I'm not giving my number out to anybody if that's the case. Um, the result of all of that growth in the electronics industry is that there is now is a lot of focus on entrepreneurism in electronics, which is what I think we're seeing uh, today, and a lot of competition for jobs in the electronics industry. We see that as a country, we see that in competition with other countries out there. Many other countries now would like to start the same kind of entrepreneurial activity that we have started in this country. But it takes certain things. First of all, it takes a certain spirit and a certain attitude. And if there's one thing that this country has, it is that pioneer spirit. Um, particularly as we get out to Oregon and, and places on the West Coast where we've had people that have left Europe come to the East Coast, left the East Coast, come to the Midwest, and then left again the Midwest and come to the West Coast, uh, we really have screened out um, all of the conservative people here. <laughs> So we are, all, we are the riskiest of the uh, bunch out here uh, today. Um, so we have that spirit in this country. We, we are pioneering. You know, we do like to be our own bosses. And that's something that uh, is very strong in this country, and, and that helps. Beyond that, however, there are other things that are needed. Um, the first thing that is needed is capital. Uh, it's necessary to have capital to be able to grow. If you look at them, um, three very successful electronics companies in Oregon, um, all very good electronics companies, um, the amount of time that it took Tektronix to grow from um, a private investment of, um, of Howard's uh, own money and time to a public company um, and to a billion dollar a year company or a $200 million a year company even, um, to a $200 million a year company was about 30 years to make that kind of growth. The amount of time that it took Floating Point to get started uh, with a little better capital formation environment and grow from inception up to about $150 million a year uh, was about uh, 12 years, so cutting that dramatically in half. And of course, the amount of time it took Mentor Graphics to grow from that same zero to about 150 million, it was about four to five years. And the difference in that is that now there is capital that's available. One of the things that happened back in uh, the late 1970s and early 1980s is we lowered the capital gains rate in this country. When we did that, we brought out uh, billions of dollars in venture capital money waiting to be invested in new firms out there. Um, that money has been invested in companies like Apple Computer, um, like uh, Intel, like Mentor Graphics, like um, uh, uh, companies like Sequence and IMS and other good companies that are small and getting started in this area here. So capital formation is very important. One of the things that is of most concern to the electronics industry and to the venture capital industry in the national tax policy is maintaining a differential between capital gains and ordinary income tax rates in order to make certain that we have enough capital for capital formation um, for venture capital deals. So people will be incented to invest that kind of money. Uh, now we have so much money in venture capital that it's almost possible to walk down the street and, uh, uh, and mention high tech and somebody will run over and hand you a $5 bill uh, and say, can I buy a little bit of stock? Um, there is a lot of venture capital money out there and that's something that this country has a lot of that we don't find in a lot of the other countries over um, in Europe or in Asia where the tax rates are much more punitive in nature. The second thing is there has to be a means of liquidity at some point in time because investors, you and I or professional investors, invest because they expect to get something back. And if they expect to get something back, then they're going to have to have a means for liquidity. In this country, we have something called the over-the-counter stock market. Uh, it turns out that the over-the-counter stock market is one of the best things that we have going for um, high technology and, and just small company formation because it allows companies that may not have a long operating history or a lot of profitability to do a public offering. Mentor Graphics did a public offering and raised $50 million after one quarter of profitability. There have been genetic engineering companies that have raised much more than that without ever having earned a nickel in profits. Um, but it has allowed them to grow and to provide uh, dramatic new products um, and to create hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of additional new jobs. So that um, capital formation market and the ability to have some liquidity are the things that this country has going for it that really must be maintained in order to keep that entrepreneurial uh, climate and environment uh, alive. 
the entrepreneurial environment tends to be very much a survival of the fittest kind of situation, uh, and it should be. Um, it, it needs to be such that the companies that uh, are weak will, through a natural selection process, fall out, maybe start other companies that will be stronger. Um, and that's exactly the way it works in this country today. Now we see Japan trying to get entrepreneurial companies started. Uh, we see European com countries trying to get entrepreneurial companies uh, going. But they don't have the capital formation, the pioneering spirit, and the liquidity mechanism that we have uh, in this country. Now, what does that translate to for Oregon? Well, one of the most important things that uh, uh, it takes to get a high technology company um, or any company going is a strong labor base. One of the best things, as far as I'm concerned, that our area, this state, and this um, locality have going for us is the quality of the workforce. Uh, we have a division down in San Jose, down in Silicon Valley. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever lived in Silicon Valley or spent much time down there. It's a little bit like living in Disneyland. Um, it's kind of a cross between Peter Pan and the uh, spinning teacups, I think. Uh, rides down there. It really is like being in a different world. Um, people stay with companies for maybe six months, they move on, um, the, the labor force goes up, it goes down, there's a lot of dissatisfaction, there's very little loyalty. What we find in Oregon is that there is a very strong labor base. The employees that we hire here um, tend to be very loyal, they tend to work very hard, there's a very good work ethic. Um, and it tends to be a, a very good place to grow a company as a result. People ask us in the early days, why don't you move down to San Jose or down to Silicon Valley when you're getting this company started because there's so many more people down there. Well, we told them that, well, uh, you know, we're going off and uh, we're risking our, um, such as they are, our modest fortunes on this. Uh, we're risking our reputations. We're risking our careers. Uh, why should we move at the same time? <laughs> there's not much more to risk. Um, people have asked us a lot about, well, what about in Oregon? The, um, the tax situation is so difficult in Oregon. For, doesn't that bother you for getting companies started? Well, when we got Mentor Graphics started, we hoped against anything that we'd come to the situation where we cared at all about tax policy, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Our greatest day was when we earned a little money so we could pay a little taxes. I thought that was great. There's no question that we need to fix the tax policy in the state. But in terms of getting a company started and the ability for that company to be successful, in my opinion, it has absolutely no bearing on it. What's needed is a flourishing business environment and one other thing. Um, perhaps the city in this country that is most analogous to, um, to Oregon or to the greater Portland area is uh, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, of course, was a very large steel producing city um, for a long time. And as many, of you may, as many of you may know, the steel industry effectively collapsed uh, probably six, seven, eight years ago. 40,000 jobs were lost in the greater Pittsburgh area because of the steel industry collapse. Since then, because of high technology companies getting started and other companies moving into the area, since 1982, 40,000 new jobs have been created in that area. And Pittsburgh now is rated, I think, as the most livable city for cities of its size. And the one thing that has made Pittsburgh as successful as it is, is the educational facilities around the city. Carnegie Mellon and the university um, in that area are strong educational institutions that have produced high quality new college graduates, that have brought companies in to do joint ventures with the university, that have provided enough of a labor force and enough of a technology movement that they have brought new companies in and they have created companies. If you look at the strong centers of electronics and software around the country, what you find is that there is a major university around them. Silicon Valley, there's Stanford. Route 128, there's MIT. In the Dallas, Austin area, there's the University of Texas. Carnegie in uh, the Pittsburgh area. There almost always is a very strong educational uh, institution. So the one thing that I believe most strongly that we need to continue to improve in the uh, state of Oregon and continue to uh, fund is the system of higher education in the state. We are, as many of you may know, doing something called the Oregon Center for Advanced Technology Education, which is a first step in this area to bring in world-class professors and offer world-class courses in electronic engineering and, and computer science. And that's a very good step. Now, in, in my opinion, <coughs> if I were uh, in the situation of allocating budget dollars from the state uh, in these areas, um, the last thing that the state of Oregon needs is a venture capital fund to invest in various companies. What we need is to take the same amount of money and put it into the educational institutions in the, in the, in the, 
in the counties. And we will build the kind of first-rate higher education institutions that we really need. We have tremendous uh, resources in the area of um, uh, biological engineering, genetic engineering, other kinds of uh, bioengineering uh, capabilities between the Health Sciences Center, between Reed, between the University of Oregon. Um, we have very strong capabilities there, and we could well become a center of bioengineering if we chose to focus on that, get a few companies going, and, um, uh, and build that kind of employment base. Uh, were we to do that, have the vision to say that um, 20 years from now we want to see Oregon having a first-rate educational system, higher education in these areas, world-class, nothing short of world-class, um, have created these industries and not put all of our eggs in a technology basket. Um, I would never suggest that we put all of our eggs in a technology basket. The electronics industry will never replace all of the jobs that are lost in the timber industry or other industries. It simply will not do that. The skills are too different. The, um, uh, the kind of growth is much too different to ever be able to do that. Um, what's needed instead is a diversification into uh, key and core areas. Pick three areas. Pick um, uh, biological sciences, genetic engineering, and um, high technology, and focus on those as things that we want to have world-class expertise in and want to build the infrastructure and some companies in, and then we, um, then we will be successful. One of the things that um, I'm asked most often about when I say that is, um, well, <clears throat> if we move electronics companies into this area, aren't electronics companies mostly um, low-paying manufacturing jobs that come in? The truth is that uh, the manufacturing jobs in electronics companies are very rapidly going away. Um, uh, perhaps one of the best examples is IBM down in Austin, Texas, uh, has just put up a new facility that has the ability of building, I think it's about 200 computers per shift. It takes eight people to do that. And in fact, they don't even turn the lights on in the manufacturing area unless someone needs to go in there to check something. The entire thing is done by robots. Um, in order to build the manufacturing facility, it was not a situation of um, let's get all the parts in and then set up the assembly line. Instead, they wrote two million lines of software in order to program the robots in order to get things going. started there. That's the way the electronics industry and the high technology industries are going, much more toward that um, automated uh, um, approach. So the things that, uh, that I would like to see us do here uh, in Oregon and would certainly like to help us do are um, focus on a few critical areas and do them very well and settle for nothing short of world class. Have our vision be that we want this state to be the leader in certain technology and other areas and that we intend to build both the employment base and the infrastructure and the educational base. Put our resources into education, higher education, building the higher education facilities that we have here. And then tell all those entrepreneurs out there that want to go off and start a company that in truth you have nothing to lose there is no better time to go off and do it and as a as a french philosopher once said um, in order to discover new lands you must consent to lose sight of the shore for a long long time um, realize that having lost sight of the shore uh, <laughs> the world is round there is shore on the other side uh, you will come back, and at the end, we will build a strong economy, I believe, for Oregon, a strong employment base, and we will have something we'll all be proud of. Thank you very much. We're going to move to the question and answer period, and the privilege of the first question goes to Jane Bloom, our board host. Thank you very much, Rosidia. Mr. Brugere, you, uh, you said that uh, what entrepreneurship needs is a thriving business climate. And uh, it, it's been said that across the nation, small startup firms create 80% of new incremental jobs. So how, do, how is this all related? What, what really contributes to the good business climate besides uh, that and the educational institutions that we need? Well, uh, in my view, what contributes to a good business climate is a strong labor base. Uh, one of the things you have to have in order to build any kind of companies is uh, employees to come to work for the companies. Um, so 
the best thing that we need, and one of the good things that we have going for us here is um, uh, a good labor base. Um, we have, um, from my industry standpoint, we have grandfather types of companies that can nurture smaller companies. Um, so a strong labor base is um, the main thing that we need. Um, that along with, um, I think, an attitude of self-confidence. Um, one of the things that uh, I think we, we do a little too much of uh, in this uh, state is, um, is criticize ourselves and uh, take a woe is me attitude. Um, one of the most important things that we need to do is realize that there are problems, but put the problems aside and move ahead with the optimism and enthusiasm and vigor to solve the problems and uh, get things behind us. That's what I would do. We have set up the microphone. Questions may be posed only by members of the City Club. If you would please use the microphone, identify yourselves. And you may ask a question about the tax structure, since uh, he spoke about capital <laughs> rates, education system, even evolution, since we talked about the survival of the fittest. So. <laughs> yes. Mr. Bergier, I completely agree with you that the one factor we lack here in Oregon is a first-rate, world-class research academic institution. But can you address the issue of how to get from here to there? Because I recall about three or four years ago, this club put out a report analyzing higher education. And the, one of the base assumptions was that there would be no additional funding for higher education. And all the institutions that you pointed out were founded with great fortunes or with great state support. And uh, if Howard Vollum had left his fortune to one institution, uh, perhaps it would do it in one shot. But could you address uh, some of the factors that would get us from here to world class? Nothing is ever easy, is it? <clears throat> um, well, we're making some good steps in that, uh, in that area. The first thing that has been needed for uh, quite some time has been cooperation amongst the institutions in the state, the uh, public and the private institutions. Um, we are now getting a lot of cooperation um, from those institutions. Um, I'm involved in the OCATE activities, and I've been very pleased to see the level of cooperation with which the various institutions have approached the, uh, the OCATE um, facility capability out in uh, Washington County. So cooperation is the first thing, realizing that, that we, we can't go in a lot of different directions at the same time, that what we have to do is we have to focus uh, whether it's a company or a state or uh, an individual and a family, you have to focus on doing one or two things very well and not try to do everything. Um, and I think that um, if we focus on those areas that we want to be top-notch in, do very well in, um, if we cooperate amongst ourselves, if we build and get the consortiums amongst uh, business, education, um, and government that are needed, um, we'll be a long ways in the right direction. Um, it may be it certainly is, that we can't snap our fingers and have a world-class educational institution. It may take 20 years, it may take 30 years. Um, nevertheless, whether we start today or we start five years from now, it's the same 20 or 30 years. And the important thing to remember is we need to start. No matter how small the start, um, whether it's the three people at Mentor Graphics or it's the um, cooperation amongst um, educational institutions and the focus, we need to start and, uh, and continue and have leadership that uh, has the vision that that's where we're going to be. Um, having done those things, I, that's what I would do. Yes, next question. John Rakowitz, member of the uh, Business and Labor Standing Committee. Uh, I believe everybody in this room agrees that we want the high-tech industry and the jobs that come along with it, but I'm not sure, f to my at least to my satisfaction, that you answered the question that you raised yourself, what are, are these low paying jobs? You gave us the example of the IBM and the fact that uh, eight bodies are needed and hundreds of computers and robots. What are the people in the high tech business doing for a living, number one? And number two, what, are, what, are, what is the wage structure? Well. I've often wondered what all those people are doing at Metro Graphics. <laughs> um, 
At, at our company, which is um, best characterized as a systems supplier, we build some computer hardware, build a lot of computer software, sell systems, um, about 70 to 80 percent of our employees are what I would characterize as professional employees. That is, they are either engineers, marketing people, financial people uh, on the professional side. Um, the other 20 percent would fall into the area of, um, of um, typically called non-exempt kind of um, individuals that would uh, do a range of different kinds of activities and often grow into some of the more uh, professional jobs. So in our company, it's about an 80-20 ratio. It would be difficult for me to answer for um, some of the other manufacturing um, companies. The, um, the wage scale for those individuals is quite good. Um, we pay at the Mentor, and uh, we hire people from other companies around the area so we know how they pay, um, relative to Silicon Valley. Uh, because that's where the norm tends to be set. And Silicon Valley pays, um, in general, 10 to 20 percent above what you would normally see in, uh, in the Northwest in general. Um, our people tend to be uh, fairly well paid for the things that they do. And in addition, um, we have things that to mentor, as do a lot of other companies, that um, reward achievement very much. So people that achieve good things, they get everything from stock options to uh, cash bonuses to trips and things like that in the way of compensation. Um, uh, there was an article um, a year or two years ago in Fortune magazine um, about companies in which the um, salespeople, some of the salespeople made more than the CEO. Uh, Mentor Graphics was prominently, good or bad, listed in that uh, organization, in that magazine article. Um, our view on that, in that situation, is uh, if these people overachieve, whether it be a salesperson or an engineer or um, uh, someone in the financial organization, if they do things that are that great and contribute that well to the company, let them work, make more money than I do, and I will personally drive out there in my Ferrari and hand them the check. <laughs> <laughs> they, have, they have football coaches and corporations as well. <laughs> Go right ahead. I would like to follow up on that then. If, you, if the jobs are well-paying, and professional jobs, many of the jobs of, of which the people in this room are certainly capable of, where are the jobs going to come from? Are they going to come from the high-tech industry for the dislocated workers, for the people who have been doing the jobs that are no longer existing, that are shrinking in our traditional industries, the timber jobs, the, all those? Are those jobs going to come from high-tech growing entrepreneurial companies? Um, I don't believe so. I do not believe that the electronics industry is going to uh, um, be able to absorb all of the people that are out of work in the timber industry. Um, and I think that it's foolish of us to think that that's the case. I think that you can't look at the situation in the very short term, which there's a very strong tendency for us to want to do, and say we lost, you know, we lost 10,000 over here, we need to gain 10,000 over here, and we'll move these people over that way. You really need to look at it in the, in the long term picture and say, um, five years from now, ten years from now, how many more jobs will we have created? How will the labor base have shifted? And one of the reasons that we need education, continuing education and higher education, um, to be strong is so that we can retrain people so that they can move from one industry to another. Because one of the drawbacks, perhaps, of moving into the high technology industry is that uh, there is a technical side to it. And many, if not most, of the people um, need to have that technical understanding. Todd Wexman, City Club member. Um, most industries go through a kind of evolutionary process in which uh, at first they undergo rapid growth and then they tend to decline and stabilize out. Um, I'm wondering with respect to the high-tech industry, do you see the recent downturn in the high-tech sector as a temporary downturn or is it indicative of a, a long-run trend? Will high-tech command the growth that it had in the late 70s? Uh, that's a good question. The, um, the, the word high-tech tends to be um, a very a global word and tends to mean a lot of different industries all lumped together. Um, what we saw in the last year is a significant downturn in the semiconductor industry and the computer industry. Also in the high technology industry, there are peripherals industries, um, there are software industries, there are a wide range of other kinds of industries. The uh, personal computer side of things, in my view, uh, is not going to be particularly strong. I don't uh, think that you and I and all of us in here are going to be buying personal computers to the level of bringing it back to where it once was. The semiconductor industry um, has turned down and will come back selectively and slowly so that we will see uh, in certain areas of semiconductor technology um, 
uh, companies doing well, but because of increased competition from the Japanese and from other um, sources, the semiconductor industry, I believe, will continue to have a difficult time through the next year. Other portions of the, uh, of the uh, technology industry, however, continue to grow. The, um, the software industry is growing very well out there. The uh, peripherals um, industry is growing very well out there. Some of the uh, new, um, I guess I would call them um, special purpose uh, semiconductors that are being uh, built out there are doing uh, quite well out there. So it's, it's selective. There are going to be parts of the electronics industry that will rise, peak, and fall off. There will be other parts that will rise, peak, and fall off to pick up a little bit from that um, overall. Um, but overall, I would see over the next five years, if you looked at the total number of jobs in that big thing that you consider to be the uh, um, electronics industry that I said have two and a half million jobs today, um, I think you will definitely see continuing growth over the next five years as a whole. Mike Hoffman, City Club member. I'd like to know how you feel about uh, Oregon's future with regards to high tech uh, directed towards either, well, there's a choice when you start talking high tech towards, say, defense related uh, areas or commercial areas because of the cyclical nature of defense uh, contracts and also that kind of leads to the question of um, SDI versus infrastructure development and your feelings on that. I, I'm going to refrain from giving my opinion on SDI. <laughs> um, it, diversification is great. Um, if we look at growing high technology in the, in the state of Oregon, we should definitely look for diversification in the high technology industry. The more different kinds of industry participants in that global high tech umbrella that we can get in, the better off we will be. Some turn down, some, um, some do okay during recessions. Um, our revenues grew about 55% during the last recession. So some companies um, will do okay during those uh, areas. Um, I would love to see us get uh, some strong defense contractors uh, in uh, electronics areas into the state of uh, Oregon. I think that would be uh, terrific. It's, uh, it's tough to do because there's a big competitor up in Seattle. Uh, Boeing is, um, is a difficult competitor, but nevertheless, um, I believe that we have a better climate for electronics companies in this state than is in Washington. I mean, I think that we can compete very strongly against some of those companies if we can get companies that want to get started and, uh, and go into the, the defense industry um, or other industries. The, um, the whole SDI program has certainly been a positive thing for the electronics industry because so much of that technology is electronic technology. And so a lot of the companies that uh, companies like ourselves or some of the other companies in this area sell to are doing research on that, and that uh, tends to help business as a result of that. Yes. Dennis Chapman, City Club member. I'm a Portland resident, but work in Vancouver at an electronics company. And I'd like to ask you two questions. First of all, could you share with us uh, some of your wisdom as to how you find and how you judge those wonderful people uh, that are working for you so that we can uh, absorb as much of that as we can from you? And second of all, in your in your efforts uh, toward uh, high technology education that you mentioned uh, going on in Washington County, have you or are you uh, coordinating at all with uh, those in Southwest Washington? And uh, if you're not, uh, do you see a value in that? Uh, and if so, uh, do you plan on doing so? If I answer the first part of that question real well, will you apply for a job? <laughs> The, the kind of people that we tend to look for at Mentor are people that are very achievement oriented. The kind of people that work out the um, least well uh, at Mentor um, are people that tend to be more political in nature um, and like to come in, surround themselves with territory, uh, derive status out of the territory. Um, the people that tend to work out the best in Mentor are the people that want to come in, take a task, and um, do whatever it takes to get that task done. Um, so we look for people who want to um, move quickly, can work in a high pressure, fast moving environment and want to come in and take responsibility and achieve things as opposed to just be a placeholder um, out there. In terms of the um, cooperation in the electronics uh, community, the uh, American Electronics Association um, Oregon Council includes um, Southwest Washington, uh, so that would be the Vancouver area. Now, that's sort of an official, um, come on to the meetings if you want to come to the meetings. Um, but uh, we have hired uh, an individual, Pat McCormick, down in, um, 
in Salem, who was responsible for um, Oregon as well as Washington, I believe now, um, to have member services uh, in the state of Oregon that is bringing in Washington as well as Southern Washington as well as Oregon to, to help with all of that. Um, so there has always been a desire. In fact, uh, I know the executive committee has tried on past occasions to get Hewlett Packard and other companies to participate, and um, uh, we would. I think they would still like to do that very much. There's a there is a desire very much to um, incorporate that whole area, even though there is. Uh, certainly some uh, competition amongst locating plants in Washington or, or Oregon. I happen to be on the side of thinking plants should locate in Oregon, um, but I understand that there are divided opinions uh, on that. But there should be cooperation, and um, uh, while I think the electronics community tends to focus on our own backyards in Oregon and worrying more about downstate Oregon and the other side of the Cascades than Vancouver, um, it should be all one family, I think. We have two people who want to ask a question. Go ahead, but we'll ask one each, if you don't mind. Barbara Clark, Business and Labor Committee. I'm intrigued by your encouraging remarks to uh, possible new entrepreneurs who might uh, start their businesses and end up competing with you. And I judge from this that you have kind of a non-traditional attitude on the subject of competition and cooperation. Would you like to say a few more words on what the word competition means to you? <laughs> Yes, to, to us, competition is very simple. Uh, it's winning. <coughs> um, we believe very strongly that, um, you know, we were an entrepreneurial company. If people um, leave Mentor Graphics to go start their own company, um, best wishes. And um, we, you know, we certainly would to give them a pat on the back and a little encouragement. If they go into competition with us, uh, watch out. <laughs> uh, is our view on that. Uh, we have done things uh, most recently, uh, such as um, we have spun off a company ourselves from uh, Mentor, a company called Context, which is uh, located in Beaverton and is a, computer, a competitor in the um, also highly competitive computer-aided publishing market. Um, and that's a company that is owned partially by Mentor Graphics and partially by the employees of the company. So we're very oriented toward uh, that kind of innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, but we are very competitive in the things we go into. Lenore Allison, City Club member. You expressed your interest in education and the support of education. Can you give us your experience with what's going on as far as what forum educators and business people are coming together in to talk about how we support education, perhaps not only higher education, but the whole educational system in Oregon, which is in pretty desperate trouble? Uh, the forum that I'm most familiar with on the technology side is the uh, Oregon Center for, for Advanced Technology Education. Um, there is a commission that was appointed by um, Governor Tia that consists of many um, CEOs of um, technology companies in the area. There is the advisory committee that consists of uh, most of, most all, if not all, of the uh, presidents of the public and private colleges throughout the state, universities throughout the state. Um, and of course has uh, some um, uh, involvement because it is a state commission uh, back through uh, the government. Uh, that's the forum that I'm most involved with and most knowledgeable about, although there are a lot of other uh, committees. The American Electronics Association has a very good educational uh, committee that's working on educational issues. And if you're interested in getting involved uh, with some of those people, I'm sure they'd be glad to talk to you about that. Um, it, there is quite a bit of interest, uh, a tremendous amount of interest in the electronics industry in this state. Uh, to help higher education in any way that we can, to help bring people together, to help uh, uh, work on lobbying with the legislature to get more funding uh, for higher education. Um, and the more people that we can get involved in helping on that issue, the better off that we are. And I think that we would definitely welcome as much participation as possible there. Tom Bouguer, we thank you for sharing your thoughts on what it takes to not only start, but to succeed with a new venture. Uh, to all of you, a reminder about next week's program, we are adjourned. <laughs>